Hello, everybody. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us. Uh, my name is Wisteria Perry. I'm the Manager of Interpretation and Community Outreach in the Department of Interpretation here at the Mariners Museum and Park. And Erica and I would uh, are very excited. Uh, this is a second um, new series that we have um, that we will be adding uh, to our overall um, schedule. It's called the Waterways of Africa. And it's something that's near and dear to both of our hearts. Um, I think a lot of people may not realize uh, just how much of a maritime connection the continent of Africa really has. Um, just looking at uh, the map that's been between our two images here, you can see that um, the continent of Africa um, has a, a large amount of rivers, there's a large number of lakes, and it's surrounded on all four sides with water. So through this program, we are going to be taking a deeper look at each one of those waterways, starting with our uh, topic of today. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to my uh, teammate, uh, Erica Cosme, who is our content uh, developer and a member of the Department of Interpretation. So Erica, it's all yours. Thank you, Wisteria. I appreciate that. Let me see if we can get going here. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. As Wisteria mentioned, we will be taking a kind of a broad overview uh, at the Nile River today. There's so much information that could be covered. I would love to one day break it down into multiple topics, but uh, for today, we're kind of just going to give some of the brief information and an introduction to this major body of water. It's pretty well known throughout the globe and to Africa. It's fairly centric to a large portion of their way of life and way of living as it has been for thousands of years. So typically when one thinks of the Nile River, it tends to conjure up images of ancient Egypt, uh, great pyramids, ancient cities, the structures we have left over uh, even today as archaeologists and Egyptologists uncover more about the people who lived there and how they live. So the Nile was extremely important to their way of living. Um, ancient Egypt dates back to about 4000 BCE. Um, that's kind of when they were reaching some of their high points. Um, they were still growing and beginning to thrive. And it was about 1800 BCE that they started reaching their peak. So they are one of the earliest civilizations. Uh, they've left behind a lot of their history, a lot of their writing, typically through a form called hieroglyphs. And from that information, as I mentioned, we know a lot about how they lived and what supported their way of life. And one of those things was indeed the Nile River. Now today we refer to it as the Nile and I'll mention where we get that term from, but the ancient Egyptians actually had their own uh, translation for it. And as you can see on the screen here, it was R or R. Um, which basically means black. And that's in reference to the sediment, the soil, the dirt and everything that was washed up on kind of along the banks and the, um, the, the riverbed that, was, that provided so much fertile soil to the land that the Egyptians used for their way of life. Um, so some of the things they used that sediment for were building materials. They used the clay from the land to build bricks, to build houses, repair those houses as well, and other buildings and structures. Um, they would also quarry limestone and sandstone from a lot of these riverbeds and uh, areas around the Nile River as well. So these are a lot of the things that they were using to build a lot of the structures that they were living in, working in, temples, uh, and a bunch of other buildings and structures that were kind of vital to their daily lives. Um, they also used this fertile land. It was kind of referred to as the Nile River Valley. And 
uh, they also used it for things like growing their food. Wheat and a lot of grains, including flax, were part of the daily diet to the ancient Egyptians. And thanks to the fertile land and soil provided from the flooding of the Nile River, they were typically able to harvest bountiful crops that helped them not just survive, but thrive. The Nile River floods were extremely important to the harvesting process for the Egyptians. If the waters were too low and not enough of the flooding occurred, then it could be possibly a year of famine. If there was too much water, it unfortunately would wash away a lot of the crops. So it kind of had to be the right balance of water that the Nile River needed to provide. And when that occurred, it was, again, it allowed for bounty amongst the food that could be grown for the ancient Egyptians. And perhaps one of the more well-known products that a lot of people have heard of is papyrus. It's a, a plant that grows along the Nile riverbanks. It was used for numerous things. One of the more uh, main or well-known things that we know Egyptians used it for was for, for paper or a paper-like material where they wrote down a lot of their information that we are able to use today to learn more about them. So you can see from these images in our collection that the Nile River and these bodies of water were, again, important to the way the Egyptian, uh, the ancient Egyptians lived. They built a lot of their cities around and along the banks of the Nile River because it just provided so much for them. And one of the main sources that the Nile River provided was for transportation. So the ancient Egyptians were some of the earliest boat builders. However, they weren't necessarily seafaring people. Uh, the country of Egypt and even ancient Egypt uh, kind of lined up. It was situated near the Red Sea on, on one side, the Mediterranean Sea above it, and then the Nile River that flowed through it. But they didn't really ferry uh they didn't really go into the, the sea waters that, that much. They relied mostly on the Nile River to travel up and down. They used these boats for transportation, transport, transportation of goods, uh, transportation of people, supplies, numerous things. And their boats were fairly simplistic in design, but they worked perfectly for what the ancients needed. So down here, on the left-hand side, we have a reed hull ship. And basically, it's exactly how it sounds. It was made by tying together a bundle of strong reeds, sometimes even use of papyrus or other materials that grew along the river, uh, the river Nile's banks. And they were bundled together really well, usually sealed with some type of either maybe not mud, but some other type of sealant that would have been used to keep it as watertight as possible. And then it typically had like a single mast that would be used to catch the wind when needed and help pull the uh, pull the ship to and from its location. So it was not the sturdiest vessel in design, but it got the job done for what the ancients needed to do. Just again, for light transportation around the areas that they knew, this was not gonna be going out into major bodies of water. Um, it probably would not fare well. And even in some of the rapid portions of the Nile, it would have needed to be in ship shape form uh, in order to, kind of survive the, the roughness that would have come with that. And then on the bottom right is a model in our collection also, um, and this is referred to as a punt ship. Now, what we know of these is that uh, Queen Hatshepsut sent many of these out as part of a trading uh, expedition. While this ship, a little more sturdy and structural in design, you can see this one has a row of oars that would have been used to transport it. And again, that single mass that would have been used to help carry it along as well. These ships, again, in a trading expedition went a little further out. Now, as I mentioned, the Egyptians weren't necessarily seafaring people. That doesn't mean they didn't necessarily ever go out. And these punch ships 
were the ones that would be going out more so into the Red Sea. There is uh, documentation that they made it as far as the Indian Ocean, but not, like I've said, really out venturing into the waters or anything like that. They would stay mostly close to shore, uh, not, to, not into rough waters or deep waters or anything. But uh, again, it was still useful for the ancient Egyptians way of living. And this top image here, it's just one of my favorites in the collection. We have several that depict not just ancient Egyptian boat building, but ancient Greek and Romans, kind of introducing us to the labor, the skills, the tools, and everything that was involved in ancient boat building design. These are the people who, they did it first. Uh, and they did it with materials that are considered much more rudimentary to what we have today in modern shipbuilding. And it's just really neat and it always impresses me. I'm, I'm, I'm a sucker for ancient culture. Um, it just always amazes me what they were able to do. And I, I'm not gonna say what they were able to do with so little, what they were able to do in just a way that almost seems impossible, yet they were able to create these grand kingdoms and cultures based around something so simple as building a wooden boat. And from there, you know, they were able to continue growing and prospering and other cultures followed and technology became more available. But the ancient Egyptians were some of the first along the lines with the Greeks and Romans who would also come along and all of their stories would eventually intertwine and kind of give us some of the earliest uh, known histories of Western culture. Now, as much as I love talking about ancient culture and the ancient Egyptians, in terms of the Nile River, one of the things I always love to remind people of is that it, it's not just Egypt that the Nile River flows through. The Nile flows through 11 total countries flows through or borders along, I should say, 11 African countries. And I've highlighted them all here. So you can see it's kind of more on the Eastern central portion of Africa, um, several countries. And here's Egypt, as I mentioned here, border, bordered by the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. And this is where the, um, the Nile River is eventually going to um, empty out into. But just take a moment and really look at how much of the country, uh, excuse me, how much of the continent the Nile River impacts. Again, 11 countries are directly bordered along or situated within the Nile River and its tributaries. So one has to imagine that this river really is a major and vital, it's, I, I guess you can kind of think of it as if Africa, the continent were like a body, uh, that the Nile River would be kind of like its, its lifeline, its blood source and everything. It really does provide, you know, it's the veins that's offering so many resources to so many different groups and different types of people. So just one of those things I love to point out because again, as much as I love ancient Egyptian culture, I can't let them get all of the credit for what the Nile River has to offer. So I'm just gonna give some basic uh, stats and figures about the Nile River. Uh, beginning, as I mentioned, the ancient Egyptians had their own word for it. We get the word Nilos, uh, Nile from the word Nilos, which was given to us by the ancient Greeks. An ancient Greek historian uh, by the name of Herodotus went into Egypt uh, back way around like the fifth century BCE and did a broad history and overview of the people who lived there and the lands that they lived and worked on. Nilos in Greek means valley, and that's predominantly pertaining to this area here, that Nile River Valley that empties out into the Mediterranean Sea right up there, which is probably one of the most fertile and prosperous areas of the Nile River. So Herodotus gives us this term, Valley Nilos, 
And from there, as translations occur over the centuries, we kind of wind up with the term Nile today. Now, Nile is more of a Western term. It is familiar to us, but other cultures and languages have their own interpretation for it. The Arabic word or term for it mentioned here, bar on Nile. Um, Arabic is one of the most predominant, Arabic Islam is one of the most predominant religions here and Arabic is one of the most predominant uh, languages spoken throughout the African region, especially this North African portion um, that much of the main source of the Nile flows through. So they do have their own term for that. Now, the Nile River, what makes it one of the more important things to know is that it is the longest river in the world. It uh, comes in at 4,160 miles. And just a lot of people question, well, they hear that the Amazon River is the longest or largest in the world. Based on how much flow and uh, discharge that the Amazon River has, that makes it the largest in the world. Um, but the Nile River is the longest. The Amazon River is only about 3,900 miles long. So a couple hundred miles uh, short from the Nile River. Its source is gonna be Lake Victoria and that's gonna be down here. And that is somewhat of a disputed topic at the moment. Recently around 2006, there was question or possibility that a different source a little further south and southwest uh, from Lake Victoria, one of its tributaries is the actual source for the Nile River, but nothing has been concretely uh, proved or kind of like the stamp of approval to all geographists and everything. So for today's purposes, we're going to kind of mention and stick with the current notion that Lake Victoria is the main source for the Nile River. Um, it flows from south to north as part of Africa right about here is actually below the equator. So Lake Victoria being here below the equator, the Nile River is actually going to uh, flow in this direction here. So up, oh, my mouse got stuck. Um, flowing up here and then again, draining into the Mediterranean Sea. Its widest point is at Edfu, Egypt and measures 4.6 miles across. And its narrowest point is at Aswan, Egypt and is only about 0.2 miles across. So from start from start to finish, so from Lake Victoria to about when it drains into the Mediterranean Sea, it takes approximately three months for the entire uh, drop of water that starts to make it all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. It's going to take about a three month journey to get there. Just kind of interesting. I guess if you did a lazy river ride on it and uh, it would take you about three months if you sat on your inner tube and just enjoyed your way through. If you have the time, uh, cool. I don't know if that's necessarily something you would want to do, but just throwing it out there. So this is part of the reason if you've ever studied ancient Egypt, if you've looked at maps, and if you've ever wondered or if you've never noticed or wondered at all, a lot of times you'll look at maps of ancient Egypt and they'll refer to the upper and lower kingdoms. Well, here, you can see it says Upper Egypt. And over here, it's kind of hard to see, but this is saying Lower Egypt, which a lot of people question, well, why is Upper Egypt below Lower Egypt? Well, that has to do with that south to north directional flow. Up here, this is technically more of the top of the river here. And then this would be the bottom if you wanna put it in terms like that. So if you, again, have ever seen a map like this, this is a great map from our collection. Um, so if you've ever seen a map like that or studied ancient Egypt and wondered why the upper kingdom is here and the lower kingdom is over there, that is why. So Lake Victoria, as I mentioned, is kind of the agreed upon source of the Nile River. Um, it does border these three countries here, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Tanzania. 
some more stats and figures for you here. It is the largest lake in Africa, measuring at nearly 27,000 square miles. And just for reference as to how big that is, it is just slightly smaller than the country of Ireland, which is a little more than 32,000 um, square miles. Basically, this is the size of a small country. Just to put that into perspective for you. Um, it is the second, fresh lar uh, second largest freshwater lake in the world, second only to Lake Superior in North America. It has a maximum depth of 276 feet. And one of the more notable, notable things that I found pretty interesting are the sea islands here. And that is a chain of islands. It's about 84 islands and about 43 uh, so just a little more than half of those islands are inhabited. They vary in size from less than 10,000 uh, square miles. And the largest one is called Bugala. That's B-U-G-G-A-L-A. -A. Um, and I did not write down what that size was. So I will have to look that up. But it is the largest of the 84 in this little, again, Lake Victoria being the size of a small country, it kind of makes sense that it would have its own kind of separate chain of islands and inhabitants living within it. And I think this is, before I move forward, a really good example of what Wisteria mentioned about maybe Africa not really being recognized for its maritime heritage and the way a lot of other ancient or even current nations and countries and empires and such were but Africa has a lot to offer in terms of its maritime heritage and history and the bodies of water that lie within it and around it. So the name Lake Victoria comes from Queen Victoria. It was named in her honor by this gentleman here, John Hanning Speak, who in the 1850s went on an expedition um, to search for the main source of the Nile. Uh, he went with a, a couple of different people, part of the um, Royal Geographical Society expedition, and he eventually made his way onto Lake Victoria and found what he believed to be the main tributary to where the Nile River began. He took this information back to England. A second expedition was sent. Everybody kind of agreed, like, yes, this must be it. And Queen Victoria being the reigning monarch of that time, as was done by a lot of uh, newfound places to the Europeans, they named it in honor of famous and well-known and royal people. So the name Victoria, Lake Victoria, comes from the great Queen Victoria shown here. Now, when we talk about the Nile River, it's important to note that part of the reason the main Nile is so associated with ancient Egypt is because the focal point of what we refer to as the Nile River does flow predominantly through Sudan and into Egypt. But there are two main tributaries that make up kind of the, the base portion, the early parts of what becomes the Nile River. The first part being the White Nile. You can see on this map here, it's kind of main vein, it's main tributary is what's flowing out of Lake Victoria, it does branch out. It gets its name from the white sediment or the lighter colored sediment, I should really say, that's being brought up and flows within the, the waterbeds and along the banks of this portion of the Nile's tributary. Um, there is some question, again, as to where the actual beginning of the White Nile starts. Some people say Lake Victoria, some people say that the true artery of it begins a little further up at a place called Lake No, further in South Sudan. But again, most people do agree that it comes from Lake Victoria itself. Um, and the White Nile, the portion of this portion of the Nile River is about 
2,300 miles long. So it does make up a good portion of the Nile River tributaries. And then you have the Blue Nile. Um, it gets its name, it's more of a darker sediment. It's not necessarily blue. Um, it, it comes from more of an Arabic word or Arabic term that was used to refer to things that were darker in color. And they used a kind of a common word and it translated roughly into blue. So this is where that Blue Nile name is coming from. And you can see this one begins over here in Ethiopia. So a little uh, further north from the White Nile. And this portion of the river is where a lot of those floods are gonna be coming from, the flood waters that I mentioned that the ancient Egyptians relied so heavily on. It's bringing in this sediment from like volcanic ash, these really rich soils and sources that are coming all the way downstream and then are making their way over here to this Nile River Valley. So the Blue Nile is not necessarily more important, but definitely has a lot more recognition for the resources that it does provide even still today, but especially to the ancient Egyptians, because as we mentioned, those floodwaters were vital to their way of life, their way of living, their ability to harvest and plant crops so that they could live. So I mentioned that if the floodwaters were too low, it could result in famine or poor crop growth or lack of growth altogether for certain crops. Too much water makes the soil not viable, or if the floods don't stop, it could wash away the seeds and other things that are being planted. So you kind of needed that, that number to be just right. So they say it's about 10 feet that would be optimum water level. And they measured this using a kind of a, a device, for lack of a better term, called a nilometer. And there were different looks to it, different uses um, on how they, different ways they were constructed. I've got two images here. This one, you can see a structure is built right up along the banks of the Nile River. And they've got these little like tick marks along the side. So you could go down and kind of see where the water levels are at and you can measure it um, as it's rising, as it's going down and just kind of monitor the situation going this way. You also had a more unique design. It was a vertical column. You can see again, kind of like tick marks or numbers uh, shown here. The Nile River, it would flow in and as those floodwaters would continue uh, draining in, would show at where the water level would be, where it was slowing down, if it was still rising, if they had to predict if it was going to be a famine year um, or an over flooding year or a year that was just just right. So um, and typically these measurings were done by specific people, oftentimes priests, um, but there were other people involved as using a nilometer was also determined on how much <laughs> they were going to tax the citizens. Um, if the year was more prosperous, that meant more taxes that they had to pay because, you know, more crops are being harvested and hopefully sold. So that means the government is going to take more of your money. Not enough crops um, or not enough money being uh, traded and brought in and sent out meant less taxes. But again, that's not necessarily a trade off considering that you don't have the growth in the harvest that you necessarily need to feed yourself or your family. I do find it funny, though, that they still find a way to incorporate taking more money from you via taxes, even as long or as far back as, as the ancient days. So this, as we're kind of in the middle of tax season now, just thought that would be a, a fun aside to mention. And here's the statue of a god, Hopi. And this was the god of the Nile River floods, um, kind of the personification of those waters 
you would pray to this God to hopefully have, again, a profitable and productive harvest season. A lot of times, you know, if it was more of a year of a famine, you would present more offerings in hopes, you know, that you would be rewarded in, in more floodwaters, or you may have deemed that the God Hopi is angry, any number of things. Religion was a very important um was very incorporated into the ancient Egyptian way of living. They had gods and goddesses for just about every facet of their daily lives. So the Nile floodwaters being one of the most important things for their survival, it makes sense that Hapi here would be one of the more important deities that would receive that attention and the prayers and the thanks. Can't forget to thank your god or gods. Um, when it is a more productive year. And this image comes from uh, the British Museum. So, and there are images of this God as well on a lot of those ancient hieroglyphs and other writings and drawings left behind. I'm a huge fan, just for the record, of Google Earth. It is a great resource. If you've never used it, it is just so much fun to play around with. I incorporate it into as many of my presentations and programs as possible because it's just such up-to-date information. And what I have shown here is where that Blue Nile River on the right and that White Nile River on the left finally merge in the city of Khartoum in Sudan. And they join to become what we refer to simply as the Nile River. So again, this is why I mentioned like when we say the Nile River, it's if you want to be technical referring to, you know, just a portion of this much larger, larger uh, body of water that flows from Lake Victoria to the Mediterranean. But oftentimes it's this confluence of the two rivers of the White and Blue Niles joining together that we officially get our Nile River here. And here's just a more close up picture of that. So you're looking at it. This is the south over here. The river's flowing north this way down towards the bottom of the screen. So this makes the white Nile over here on your right hand side, the blue Nile over here on your left hand side. And then you can see where they start to merge and join and become one. Pretty cool. I would definitely, love to see that in person. I'll have to add it to my ever-growing bucket list, which at this point is probably overflowing, but what's one more? So we talk a lot about how the Egyptian people and the ancient Egyptians in particular relied so heavily on this body of water that we refer to as the Nile River and all of its tributaries and veins that kind of flow into it. But it's not just them who have utilized the resources that come from this, as I've mentioned, major and very important body of water that goes through or borders 11 total countries in Africa. There is a term used, the Nilotic people, and from its as you see here from uh, what I've written, you can kind of see that it's referring to the groups of people. Uh, the different cultures, African tribes, who have made their way of living along the source of the Nile. And again, the main, uh, the various branches that also flows through it. So this is more of an anthropological term. Each tribe and each group has their individual name there, but they all have very similar cultures and languages. And they are defined as, I'm going to read this first one here from dictionary.com. So Nilotic people or Nilotes, which is the plural term, relates to the Nile River or the inhabitants of the Nile region. And then the free dictionary mentions it as a member of any of a number of African peoples of the upper Nile River drainage and East African steppes who share physical and cultural features and speak what are taken to be related languages. So 
basically as Europeans were going into Africa and exploring more of their lands and encountering a lot of these peoples, they kind of lumped them into this one category um, and gave them this, this term referring to them as Nilotic people, which is accurate as they do make their living, as I've mentioned, throughout and along the Nile River region. But even though they share very similar cultural languages, um, similar, you know, look and features and the way they interact with each other, they do have their differences as well. And I unfortunately don't have time in today's presentation to go as far into this topic as I would love, but I encourage you to follow the Mariners Museum um, webpage and everything, because this is a topic I wholeheartedly plan on expanding furthermore on down the road as we kind of continue this waterways of Africa presentation. Um, but for today's purposes, it's more of an introduction to these types of people. So in 1971, a historical linguist by the name of Christopher Ehret went in and he studied and mingled with all of these groupings of people or various ones, I should say, and kind of brought a lot of information to light of what these people, um, how they relate to each other, where they kind of evolved and originated from in their migratory. A lot of them are nomadic um, based on the annual flood seasons, based on the way the current uh, climate of the land is. Uh, they're mostly a, they mostly rely on their cattle for, um, for trade, for their food, and so they're herders, essentially, and they do grow crops as well. So again, kind of relying on the, uh, the resources that the Nile River kind of provides to the various lands. So he mentions that Historical linguistic research into the Nilotic languages, together with a consideration of the contemporary geographical dis distribution of languages, suggests that the original proto-Nilotic language community in their homeland to the southwest of the southern Ethiopian highlands probably started to break up into three groups about 4,000 years ago. These groups of proto-Nilotic then began to change independently into the ancestral languages of what are today recognized as the Western, Eastern, and Southern Nilotic groups of languages. So to summarize that very technically explained uh, description, essentially these Nilotic peoples migrated from as far north as to where the Nile River kind of drains into the Mediterranean to as far south as to where the Nile River begins down in the Tanzania uh, area. And I think this is just a great example on how, you know, they kind of followed this river to make their way of life and to create these very populous groups and create their own culture living um, off of the resources that are provided on the land. And just if you were curious about the two images you're looking at, on the left here, you have a group of Maasai warriors in East Africa. And this was uh, taken around 1906 to 1918. And on the right hand side, you can see a Maasai woman, and this is the official title of the photo here, Maasai woman, wearing her finest by our request. So I guess the photographer may have asked her to put on her best and brightest clothings and it is so beautiful. I mean, the, the colors, the patterns, everything about it. And if you do any additional research into the Nilotic people on your own, you're gonna see this vibrancy in their clothing, in their daily life. Um, as you can see on the image on the left, they've got their shields and their swords. They're a very, I just, I could go on about it, but they are very, they're just a great group of people who, as I've said, just relied on the Nile River and managed to make these large cultural groupings. And I cannot wait to learn more about them and incorporate them into 
more on what we know about the Nile River and how it's just such a vital importance to so many cultures throughout the, con uh, the continent. So one last thing I kind of want to mention is that according to the 2019 revision of the World Population Prospects published by the United Nations, the total population of Nilotic people was 51,392,565 in 2018. There are anywhere between 23 to 50 language groupings of these Nilotic people, but the actual number of tribes is probably a little bit more than that, and I don't have the exact number. But this number of 51 million plus shows that they are indeed still a very mainstay culture of the African continent. Now, the different tribes do have different population numbers. Some populations are unfortunately uh, starting to, their numbers are starting to drop. A lot of these nomadic tribes and Nilotic peoples are having to move as the construction of the Aswan Dam in the 1970s stopped that annual flooding that I mentioned, and it more regulates the influx and flow of the Nile River water into particularly the Nile Valley, but um, to parts of Egypt and Sudan and surrounding areas there. So it's kind of affected the way the land that a lot of these other cultures and populations um, that they live on, it's starting to affect that. Uh, so the Aswan Dam isn't necessarily a bad thing. It does provide, as I mentioned, water, electricity, and other resources that are, you know, necessary for a more modern way of living. Unfortunately, though, there is some negative impact, which uh, I know that a lot of countries are constantly talking about in order to find ways to stave off this, this, uh, negative side effect, so to speak, um, for this dam's construction. So, but again, this is something I really hope to expand upon a little further on. This is indeed, as Wasiri mentioned, just the first of what should be several more programs within this Waterways of Africa um, series and everything. But for today's purposes, I kind of just wanted to give an introductory um, of sorts to what the Nile River is, what it has to offer, its impact, both past, present, and possibly future. And as we wrap up Black History Month, I think it's just kind of a great incorporation. I'm so thrilled to kind of be ending on this note with this program that's gonna be part of a new series that extends outside of what we've been talking about this Black History Month. Um, so with that, that is my presentation on the waterways of Africa, the Nile River. Um, I do have here before I open it to questions, um, if any more information on what I've covered here is in my email, ecosme at marinersmuseum.org. Always happy to answer any questions that maybe weren't thought of today or if research information is needed. Love helping out with information like that. Beneath that is catalogs.marinersmuseum.org. And this is our institutional um, website that you can look at the thousands of objects we have in our collection, both related to this topic and several other topics related to maritime history and culture. And last but not least, marinersmuseum.org is our main website. Uh, we have programs throughout the entire year on a variety of topics presented by a variety of people at our institution, both volunteers and people within our various departments here at the museum. Uh, there's a calendar for any events, so stick with us and kind of look to see what's happening as we have a lot to offer as we move into this new stage of the museum world um, based on the way the pandemic has affected us all and everything. So we're really excited about what we are going to be offering. And um, I didn't mention at the beginning, I had this 
on uh, one of the first slides, our mission statement here, the Mariners Museum in part connects people to the world's waters because through those waters, through our shared maritime heritage, we are connected to one another. And we love spreading that sentiment um, because we truly believe it. And there are so many ways, even when you don't think that you may be connected to the waters, there are so many ways that we can actually show that we really are all connected. And with that, I will go ahead and take a step back and do my best to answer any questions that may have come up during my program. Wisteria? All right, I do have a couple questions for you. Sure. So our first one is, how does Lake Victoria compare to the Great Lakes? Um, I'm not 100% sure. As I mentioned, and I don't have the exact number of how big Lake Superior is, but Lake Superior is the largest freshwater lake on the planet. So if Lake Victoria is the second largest at, um, let me see if I can remember the number here. Um, I think it was, yeah, 27 at nearly 27, a little over 27,000 um, square miles. I would have to assume Lake Superior, if nothing else, is much larger than that. And then I, I apologize, I don't know the sizes for the other um, lakes within that uh, system, but that should give you at least a, a general idea of how big Lake Superior is. So it's probably closer to the exact size of Ireland, if not even slightly larger, just based on that information. And also let me throw out there that um, Lake Victoria is one of three major lakes that's considered as the African Great Lakes. So it's uh, Lake Victoria, Lake Tanzania, and Lake Nasa, which used to be called Lake Malawi. So just to give you guys a, an idea. So thank you, Erica. Yeah. Um, our second question is, what was the name of Lake Victoria, Lake Victoria before it was named after the Queen? Ah, you know what? I had, this is why you shouldn't play around with your slides <laughs> when you're putting a program together. Um, I had briefly started contemplating whether or not I should go into that and I should have. Um, the Africans had their own name for it and I didn't delve too far into it for time purposes. So again, I apologize, I don't have that. Um, and part of the reason I purpose, purposefully left that out is because, as I said, the Nile River is a topic that I intend to expand further on and incorporate information like that, focusing a little bit more on uh, that African interpretation of the Nile River. So I apologize, I don't have an exact answer to that because I, I would have gone down a rabbit hole that would have made this presentation probably way too long for the time I was allotted. Um, all I can do is say, feel free to check us out, you know, down the road, and that could be something I cover a little more in depth uh, as I expand on this topic. And then, uh, wasn't the Nile River known as the Happy? Or yeah, so the Happy, the Happy. Um, that God that I mentioned, again, was the personification of that. And yes, it was another name for the Nile River, the Nile River floods more importantly, or more specifically, but yes, it was another name for that as well. Fantastic. Um, we have another question here. Um, let's see. Is there a possible solution for Egypt and the Ethiopian dispute over the new Ethiopian dam? Oh, that is, that is a great question. As of right now, from what little I, and I didn't go too far into it, from what little I saw, there is no, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's no, I can't think of the word. They haven't quite come to an agreement on how that actually is going to, to be. Um, as far as I know, that's one of the things, as I mentioned, that they are still kind of talking about and figuring out, you know, ways around or ways that the dam can still be incorporated and everything, but not so heavily affect certain aspects 
uh, certain side effects that come from that as well. So as far as I know, there's no resolution, but I do know that they're at least in communication on, you know, coming up with ways, not necessarily around it, and I'm sorry, I'm fumbling over my words, but um, it's just something that is probably going to take time before they come to any type of like true resolution that's going to work for all sides and all parties involved. And uh, we do have another one here. It's uh, this one's coming from uh, Terrence. It says, um, I live on the Mississippi River and I have visited other cities along the Mississippi like Memphis, St. Louis, uh, Minneapolis. I find the culture of those cities were very similar. In particular, the people are more friendly, more welcoming to different races and cultures, and the food is delicious in each one. <laughs> <laughs> you and I have been chatting about this. Yes. Uh, do you find a similar similarity in cities along the Nile? Yes, you do. Um, both a lot of those ancient Egyptian cities that I mentioned were uh, built very similarly to each other. They did have, of course, their differences. Um, but again, even those Nilotic tribes that I mentioned as well, they are all very similar in their language, culture, and traditions. And part of that reasoning is because of the way they've established themselves along this body of water, the major river, the Nile River. Um, so there are a lot of similarities that are, a lot of cultural similarities that kind of translate between each different grouping and such. Um, so the short answer would be yes. I have personally not been to Africa at all, let alone Egypt or any of the other cities that the Nile River is situated on. So I will, you know, put it in next year's budget for me to go and try and answer this question in person, especially I the food. Go. Yeah, especially figuring out, you know, making sure that the food is indeed similar. I, I can definitely uh, foresee that being a great uh, team building trip, um, but we shall see. <laughs> but yes, is the answer to that question. Fantastic. All right. Well, I'm looking to see if we have any other um questions we do have um <laughs> we just had someone say please take us with you yeah, yeah we'll do it all we'll make it a a, a museum field trip Fantastic. make it happen trust me and um, i will tell you we do have some ideas for expanding out not just this series with the waterways but also one that we introduced uh, earlier in the month called um, African Kingdoms and Maritime Cultures. And so I think food will definitely pop up in there. I've been playing with a few ideas. Um, Erica has been watching my post on Facebook so she knows I've been playing around with a few things. So Excited. stay tuned. <laughs> All right, I'm looking to see if there's any other uh, questions um, or anything. It doesn't look like. So we, um, we d I definitely want to say thank you all so much for uh, joining us on the first of many um, presentations dealing with the waterways in Africa. And keep in mind that we're not just keeping this to rivers, but we're going to be uh, tackling a lot of the lakes and not to mention uh, the four oceans that or bodies of water that surround the continent. So um, uh, Erica, is there anything you wanted to add to this? No, I, I want to kind of echo that. Um, tomorrow is officially the last day of Black History Month. We had so many great programs um, that we did this year done a little differently than we have in years past due to the, the pandemic, which honestly, as a blessing in disguise has allowed us to expand our reach to meet, uh, to, um, to present our programs to even more people outside of the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. And honestly, I, I think it's great. And I, I'm definitely very happy with the way this month has has looked and the way we're going to expand on it and we thank you all for giving us your time today i don't know what it's like everywhere else it's a little gray and and rainy here mm -hmm. um but it's not too cold at least so um thank you all for your time today we really appreciate it and look forward to having you at any of our other 
of programs. There is a survey and I'm not sure. It's in, uh, there's been attached into the link. Okay, great, great. So there is a survey. Please feel free to give us any feedback you think could A, help us improve our programs or any topics that you might think would be worth us looking into and possibly presenting in the future. All right. Otherwise, I will say thank you. Thank you. And also keep in mind that there is uh, this presentation has been recorded, so it'll uh, pop up on our Mar uh, Mariners Museum a YouTube page uh, within a few business days. So uh, thank you all very much. Uh, take care and we look forward to the next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.